Part 3. The Marvel of Instruction Modes of Teaching The body of Luang Por Cha's teachings is generally considered to consist of the material recorded on reel-to-reel tapes and audio cassettes and then transcribed and printed in books, originally in Thai and subsequently translated into many other languages. But for his monastic disciples, the formal discourses captured by those audio recordings and reproduced in books were only one part, and perhaps not the most important part, of what they received from him. Luang Po's most powerful teaching for those who lived with him was arguably not what he said or even what he did, but who he was and who he was perceived to be. His disciples saw him as the living, visible proof that there was truly an end to suffering and that it could be achieved through practice of the Noble Eightfold Path. Seeing him, sensing him nearby, gave them the strength of mind to endure the difficulties of the training. In the beginning, it was often faith in the teacher himself rather than in specific, profound teachings he imparted that kept young monks in the robes. Charisma is not an inevitable fruit of liberation. Some fully enlightened beings prefer a life of obscurity and project a quiet and unobtrusive air that makes them almost invisible. Luang Po was not such a figure. He was, in all meanings of the word, an impressive monk. His presence impressed itself effortlessly upon those around him. One Western monk said of him, If any human being deserves to be called a force of nature, it's Luang Po. The Buddha referred to the teacher as the Kalyana Mitta, or good friend. He was not a guru to be worshipped, but a wise and compassionate guide on the path. He inspired strong confidence through his impeccable practice of the Vinaya and the monastic observances. He practiced what he preached and did not ask his disciples to do anything that he would not do himself. He taught monks to spend every spare moment on the walking meditation path and he would often be seen pacing up and down on his own path. The sense of solidity and unwavering purpose in the way he lived his life transmitted itself to his disciples. The feelings of faith, love and devotion, respect and reverence that Luang Po inspired in those around him provided the emotional context in which his oral teachings were received and played an important part in the effect they produced. Teaching ability is as little an inevitable outcome of liberation as charisma. Inarticulate unenlightened monks usually become inarticulate enlightened monks. Luang Po, however, had always been a fine and fluent speaker. As Kalyanamitta to a large group of monks and lay supporters, his ability to transmit the teachings in a clear and rousing manner, appropriate to his audience, became renowned. Ajahn Jan, a fine Dhamma teacher in his own right, found the talks so gripping he could enthuse about them half a lifetime after his first exposure. Luang Po gave talks almost every day. If someone had misbehaved, then the talk might go on for hours. His voice was loud, resonant, very powerful. You felt how determined he was that his listeners should understand. It was as if he wanted his words to wear down his disciples' defilements until they were as smooth as a drumskin. His talks were on many different levels, He would talk in one way to the Sangha when there were no lay people present, another way when there were, and another way if he was addressing the lay people directly. He would tell us off, but not angrily. He never ran out of words. The talks were incredibly forthright and bold. He wasn't afraid of anyone. Listening to him talk, you were never bored. You were enthralled. And what he said hit home so well that even to this day his words are still ringing in my ears. As monks walked out of the Dhamma Hall after one of Luang Po's talks, 
it was not rare to hear voices exclaiming that parts of the talk were specifically aimed at them, how marvellous it was that Luang Po should have chosen to speak on the very subject that was currently obsessing them. Monks would speak of labouring for some time over a doubt, and then how the talk addressed that problem directly and in detail, putting their mind to rest. Ajahn Anik said, His words pierce to your heart. Most people's doubts about meditation would be answered during his formal talks. He would deal with exactly the problem that was frustrating you, no matter how subtle it might be. If you listen closely to every word he said, you'd find it exactly right for you. That was his genius. It was truly profound. In some cases, perhaps the majority of them, the belief monks held that Luang Po was talking to them personally may be put down to the flowing, unstructured nature of his discourses. The number of defilements is finite, and in a long talk it's unlikely that any one of the major ones will go unmentioned, at least in passing. Indeed, Luang Po sometimes referred to casting his net with more general observations about mental defilements that hauled in all those who were affected by them. However, there were also occasions where monks were particularly moved by passages in his talks that took an unexpected deviation from the flow of the discourse. Beyond dispute was the way in which the formal talks set the tone in the monastery. In the days following a particularly inspiring talk, there would be a tangible buoyancy in the air. In the days after an admonitory exhortation, even the colours of the forest could seem subdued. Luang Po would spend time every day, longer as he got older and less active, sitting on a wide wicker seat underneath his kuti, making himself available for anyone who wished to speak to him. During the day, most of Luang Po's conversations were with lay supporters, but monks and novices acting as attendants would enjoy the opportunity to listen to him answer his guests' questions and offer reflections. Monks with free time would often sit down in a corner and listen. Sometimes Luang Po would shoo them away. No need to sit around here, go away and meditate. At other times, he would permit them to stay. In the evenings, after the group chanting and meditation had ended, a number of monks would gravitate to Luang Po's kuti in order to listen and learn, and sometimes just to sit quietly with their eyes closed in meditation. On one occasion, a Western monk was sitting listening to Luang Po answering questions with short, succinct answers, concise but profound. And after the guests had left, he had exclaimed, Luang Po! That was just like Zen. And Lung Po replied, No, it wasn't. It was just like me. Not all of Lung Po's teachings have been preserved. Occasionally, he would speak privately with monks whose meditation practice had reached an advanced level. The advice given during those conversations has never been revealed. It's worth bearing in mind that the Dhamma talks that have been recorded and transcribed for all their richness, are restricted to Luang Po's public teachings. Although Luang Po was always available to disciples struggling with doubts about the practice, he did not necessarily answer the questions he received, or if he did, not in the way that they expected. He was not interested in spoon-feeding the Dhamma. Sometimes, sensing that no answer he gave would serve any useful purpose, that it would simply increase the questioner's confusion or conceit, he would refuse to answer at all. This was not always to the questioner's liking. Luang Po would shrug. If they had even a glimmer of understanding, they wouldn't ask such questions in the first place. He continued, The more you explain, the more doubts you'll create in their minds because they haven't practiced to a point where they can understand. If they practice, then they'll know for themselves and be free from doubts. 
inexperienced meditators were like small children who did not as yet understand the world around them. When the child sees a chicken, he asks, Dad, Dad, what's that? When he sees a duck, it's, Dad, Dad, what's that? Then he sees a pig, and again it's, Dad, Dad, what's that? Eventually, the father can't be bothered to answer. There's no end to the questions because to the child, everything is new. In the end, the father just replies, Mmm, mmm. If he were to answer every single question, he'd die of exhaustion. The child isn't tired at all. It never stops asking. Eventually, the problem disappears by itself as the child gets older and more experienced. In the same way, if you are devoted to reflection and persevere until you comprehend the way things are, then problems will gradually clear up by themselves. Luang Po praised disciples who treated their problems as challenges to be overcome. He wanted monks to learn how to develop their own skillful means to deal with difficulties, rather than allowing themselves to become overly dependent on him. Most doubts about meditation practice were resolved through becoming aware of the nature of doubt itself, seeing it as a conditioned phenomenon and not identifying with it. This was one reason why he was not in favour of the daily interviews popular in meditation centres. It took too much responsibility away from the meditators and deprived them of the opportunities to grow in wisdom. The Thai term for such interviews between meditation teacher and student is Sob Arom, literally mood inspection. And Lung Po once joked, even dogs know their own moods. When they feel hungry, they howl. His advice was to keep putting as much effort as possible into formal meditation. In the body of practices that make up monastic training, Sitting and walking meditation constitute the backbone. Those whose practice is going to be strong are the ones who don't neglect their walking meditation, who don't neglect their sitting meditation, who don't let slip their sense restraint. Each monk had a walking meditation path, some twenty to thirty paces long by the side of his hut. As soon as the daily meal and clean-up was completed, the monks were encouraged to return immediately to their huts, put their robes out on a line to air, and begin to practice walking meditation. For those who did that regularly, their walking path is worn into a furrow. I've seen it myself many times. Monks like that don't feel jaded or stale in their meditation. They have energy. They have real power. If you all give that kind of attention to your practice, it will go well. The training that Luang Po provided his monks was a well-rounded one. Monks learned how to meditate and were encouraged to meditate a lot. But they also learned the Vinaya in great detail. They also learned how to give the precepts to the lay people, how to chant blessings and how to conduct funeral rites. They learnt how to build and take care of the monastery and how to teach. When the time was ripe to begin their own monastic community, they had been furnished with all the basic tools that they would need to survive and flourish. Lung Po would sometimes speak about the qualities of a good teacher. He must understand the way his disciples' minds work, just as a carpenter must understand the particular qualities of each kind of wood. Or he must be like doctors who know their patients, the cause of their illness and the appropriate medicine to cure their condition. Or he would say it's like fishing. If the fisherman casts his net at random over the whole of the river, he won't get any fish. He must wait until a fish breaks the surface of the water and then cast his net at exactly that spot. To teach, you have to look to see how much the student can take, he said. Look at what's just right for them. 
because it's the just rightness that is the Dhamma. Long Po's ability to pitch his teachings on the just right level was so unerring that it convinced many monks after private conversation with him that he had been reading their minds. This may well have been true, but in most cases, the effectiveness of his words may be as easily attributed to acute observation based upon long experience. Ajahn Suryon gave an example. The Western disciples like to see Long Po laugh and smile and give them opportunities to ask questions. If he didn't do that and seemed indifferent towards them, they'd find it oppressive. So Long Po would give them lots of attention, frequently asking them how they were, how their practice was going and so on. The Thai monks didn't expect the same kind of personal attention. If he saw that the Thai monks understood his teaching well enough, he didn't say much to them, but he'd find appropriate skillful means to teach monks who were dull or unintelligent. With monks of an angry or negative disposition, he would speak humorously or give examples that emphasized kindness and gratitude. Once they felt relaxed, the minds of these monks would become receptive to what he was teaching and experience some joy and uplift in the Dhamma. As a result, they would feel inspired and their practice would progress. Ajahn Anaik recalled another of the similes Lung Po used to describe the qualities of a teacher. He said, How could I be a teacher? if I didn't understand the way my disciples' minds work. It's like the owner of a banana plantation. If he doesn't know all about bananas, their trunks, their leaves, their fruit, then how could he run a plantation? It's all just a matter of body and mind. It doesn't matter whether it's young monks, old monks, monastics or lay people. If their minds have fallen under the power of defilement, then there's no difference between them. Given Luang Po's profound understanding of the relationship between the body and mind, it was not difficult for him to recognize his disciples' dispositions. He would observe them walking, standing, sitting, lying down, changing posture, eating, bowing, working. He would notice their alertness and attention to detail when performing duties for him. Every action told him a story. The Buddha once said that just as integrity is to be known through long acquaintance and fortitude through adversity, wisdom is to be measured by speech. Luang Po observed how monks conducted themselves and how they expressed themselves. Meanwhile, Ajahn Liam observed Lung Po. Mostly, he would gauge monks' knowledge from how they spoke. He would observe their reflections on Dhamma and the wisdom that was revealed in their speech. At the end of the rains retreat, he would have all the monks and novices take turns to ascend the Dhamma seat and talk about their experiences during the retreat to the lay people. This was one method he used to see how people's practice was going. Did they possess the qualities of a Dhamma speaker? You weren't to have any desire to give a talk, because then Luang Po considered that you were just following craving. He wanted to see who had a sense of responsibility. He wanted us to train in that way to see if we had any particular abilities. If we hadn't had to do that, we would never have known. Luang Po would say that once you can ground your mind in the present moment, everything is ready to teach you. Insights into the three characteristics arise naturally in the mind. Often, he would share his own reflections with those around him. His disciples would treasure these teachings and observations not so much because they were especially profound, although sometimes they were, but rather it was because they were grounded in a particular event in which the listener participated, and so took on an immediacy, an intimacy and context that was not easily forgotten. 
Ajahn Pasano, for example, recounted how one morning, while returning from arms round, a pair of lizards copulating in a roadside tree fell off their branch and landed right in front of Lung Po. Still stuck together, they lay on the ground, looking stunned from the fall. Lung Po pointed at them, chuckling. Do you see that? They were enjoying themselves so much up there, they became heedless. Now they've fallen down and hit the ground. It hurts. Luang Po created an environment in which every element of monastic life provided challenges and learning opportunities for his disciples. His formal discourses provided his disciples with the reflective tools to profit from them. Sometimes there could be an almost sly quality to Luang Po's skillful means. He introduced small tests of mindfulness and wisdom for his disciples that were like the concealed traps of a hunter in the forest. One monk remembered an almost comical example. In the midst of a relaxed and informal meeting under Lung Po's Kuti, a number of conversations taking place at the same time, Lung Po must have sensed that things were becoming a little too exuberant and monks were losing their mindfulness in the pleasure of conversation. Without warning, he stopped speaking and began to sit in silence with eyes downcast. Monastic etiquette deems it impolite to carry on a conversation in front of one's teacher. The disciple takes his cue from the master. If the teacher speaks informally, so can he. If the teacher stops speaking, then so does the disciple, immediately. But it's hard not to get caught up in a conversation and easy to lose awareness of a situation. The monks carried on talking for a while, one by one, look by look, and then by a sudden avalanche of urgent nudges, they stopped and tried to compose themselves. As if in a theatrical skit, there remained a single monk relating some humorous anecdote, and then in one awful moment realizing that the atmosphere had changed completely. Everyone around him was sitting impassively with eyes downcast, there was no need for Luang Po to utter any words of admonition. In a similar vein, a monk recalled how, while walking to a local village on arms round, Luang Po engaged him in conversation. In such a situation, etiquette demanded that he walked slightly behind Luang Po and to one side, with the remaining monks expected to walk some few steps behind. All of a sudden, Luang Po stopped still. The monks whose minds had wandered collided with the monk in front of them, and the line came to a shuddering halt. Lung Po, looking very innocent, said nothing. At the next Dhamma talk, he spoke about the importance of mindfulness and alertness in every posture, for example, on arms round. Sense restraint, circumspection, mindfulness and alertness, Sensitivity to time and place. These were basic monastic virtues that Luang Po never tired of impressing on the minds of his disciples. He would say that someone who loses their mindfulness is no different from a madman, and he would quote the Buddha's words from Dhammapada verse 21. Heedfulness is the path to the deathless. Heedlessness, the path to death. Worldly Winds A monastery does not provide an escape from the vicissitudes of life. It does provide a framework in which a wise attitude towards them may be cultivated. The Buddha referred to four pairs of transient conditions inherent in the human realm that needed to be clearly understood. The Buddha taught that the eight worldly dhammas of gain and loss Status and obscurity, praise and blame, pleasure and pain are inescapable features of human life. Even liberated beings experience these conditions. But knowing them for what they are, impermanent, unreliable events, they remain unfazed by them. 
Luang Po frequently reminded his disciples to maintain a contemplation of the nature of the eight worldly Dhammas and not to get pulled about by them. He said that only fools believed that they could enjoy the desirable worldly Dhammas without encountering their undesirable counterparts. They were inseparable. His teachings on the eight conditions were often very practical. They commonly consisted of confronting monks with the consequences of attachment by depriving them of one of the four desirable worldly dhammas or provoking one of the undesirable ones. Luang Po might, for example, test a monk by praising him on a number of occasions and then, with no forewarning, roundly criticize him. The monk was encouraged to observe that the degree to which he was upset by the criticism was an indication of the degree to which he had identified and taken pride in the praise. On other occasions, Luang Po might give a monk a great deal of attention for a certain period of time and then completely ignore him for a while. The monk would be left feeling hurt and forced to acknowledge that the pain he experienced was chiefly determined by the extent to which he had allowed himself to feel flattered with the attention and had indulged in a sense of being special or entitled. Transmitting the theory Lukewarm would probably best sum up the attitude of the forest monasteries of Isan to the academic study of Buddha Dhamma. With their focus on the practice and realization of the truth of the teachings, the abbots of these monasteries have considered in-depth study of them to be a two-edged sword. While they recognize that a knowledge of key teachings provides the necessary theoretical basis for practice, they have been suspicious of the seductive nature of study. Gaining more and more intellectual knowledge about the path can easily come to seem more important than actually walking it. Over the years, Luang Po gave many analogies for such an error. He said it was like a person who pours over a map but does not make the journey, or one who reads the label on the medicine bottle but does not take the medicine. Luang Po and his contemporaries expressed concern at how book learning tended to stimulate the speculative, restless traits of their disciples' minds that other aspects of the training were designed to restrain. Most importantly, perhaps, they were concerned by the way in which concepts absorbed from the texts created expectations in the minds of their disciples that hindered rather than helped their meditation. One of Luang Po's most well-known injunctions to newcomers was Don't read books. Read your mind. You may know how to write the word greed, but when greed arises in your mind, it doesn't look like the word. Anger is the same. You may have it down on the blackboard as an arrangement of letters, but when anger arises in your mind, you don't have time to read anything. It's already too late. This is very important, extremely important. Your knowledge is correct. You've spelt the word correctly, but now you have to bring it inwards. If you don't do that, then you won't know the truth. On reaching a state of meditative calm, he said, the tendency of the scholar is to instinctively reach for his knowledge of the texts to interpret what he is experiencing. That movement of the mind to name or classify the experience causes the experience to dissolve. If a student of the texts grasps on tightly to his knowledge and upon entering peaceful states likes to keep noting, what's this? Is this the first jhana yet? Then his mind will simply make a complete retreat from the calm and he'll get nothing from it. Why is that? Because he wants something. The moment there's craving to realize something, the mind withdraws from the calm. That's why you've got to throw away all your thoughts and doubts and take only your body, speech and mind into the practice. Look inwardly at states of mind, 
but don't drag your scriptures in there with you. It's not the place for them. If you insist on doing so, then everything will go down the drain, because nothing in the books is the same as it is in experience. It's precisely because of this attachment that people who study a lot, who have a lot of knowledge, tend to be unsuccessful in meditation. It was not that the forest monks rejected study altogether. They were exceptionally thorough in their studies of the Vinaya, particularly of the Pubbasika commentary. Indeed, the importance they gave this text is one of the defining characteristics of the whole tradition. Many monks had, moreover, also completed the Thai Sangha's national three-tier Dhamma Vinaya curriculum, the Naktam, before they became disciples of Lung Bu Man, and so they began their practice in the forest with a solid theoretical foundation. Lung Po himself falls into this category. Nevertheless, the forest Sangha's apparently dismissive attitude to study tended to raise the hackles of scholar monks many of whom saw the forest monks as ignorant mavericks, following their own opinions rather than the words of the Buddha. In fact, a low-level mistrust between meditators and scholars has been a feature of Sangha life since the time of the Buddha. In one sutta, recorded in the Anguttara Nikaya 6s, Sutta 46, Venerable Mahachunda sensibly encourages the forest monks and scholars to appreciate each other's good qualities rather than criticize their shortcomings. In the case of Wat Ba Pong, the relationship with the scholarly community took a significant turn for the better in 1967, when a locally prominent scholar, Ajahn Maha Amon, joined the Sangha and was enthusiastic in his praise of Luang Po. In one respect, Luang Po's emphasis on oral transmission of the teaching within the context of a teacher-student relationship was a return to the ways of early Buddhism. If there was a weakness to his impromptu style, it was that his Dhamma talks, being unsystematic by definition, did not cover the whole breadth of Buddha Dhamma and were difficult to remember. Their strength lay in his grounding the theory of Dhamma, the Bariyati, firmly within the lives of his disciples and their practice, the Patipati, for liberation, Patiweda. He selected the teachings that he felt were of most benefit, given the time and place and audience. But in the first year at Wat Bapong, with a small community of just seven monks, Luang Po, ever the experimenter, was as yet undecided on the value of the Nak Tam curriculum. He decided to teach it himself in order to determine the advantages and disadvantages. It was the first time that he'd taken on such a role since his last frustrating rains retreat in Bangkok, after which he had embarked upon the life of the Tudong monk. He taught the course over a period of 48-hour days. In the cold season, the monks took the exams and all passed. But it was as he had feared. The monks found it hard to integrate the sense restraint and single-mindedness required to develop their meditation practice with the memorization and discussion that are essential to study. They forgot themselves, he said simply. He found monks becoming neglectful of their meditation. The amount of socializing increased, together with its accompanying worldliness, mental agitation and formation of cliques. The serene atmosphere of the monastery was significantly diminished. He was, however, at pains to point out that the problem did not lie in study itself. In fact, all the teachings point out the way for us to practice. But having begun to study, if you get caught up in chatting and frivolity and dispense with your walking meditation, then you'll start wanting to disrobe. Actually, he said, when performed mindfully, reading and memorization are forms of meditation. It's not that study itself is at fault, but the lack of application and discernment on the part of the students. 
Following his unsatisfactory experiences in this first year, Lung Po suspended the teaching of Naktam. In later years, however, when the number of monks had increased and Luang Po became concerned by how little knowledge they had of the basic teachings, he relented, delegating one of his senior disciples to provide the instruction. But familiar problems started to appear in the Sangha, outweighing the gains. Eventually, Luang Po compromised by allowing monks interested in pursuing their studies to do so alone in their spare time. The monastery supplied the necessary textbooks and arranged for monks' official registration with the National Examination Board, but everything else was left to self-study. After the exams were over, Luang Po would tell the monks to put their books away and now concentrate on reading their minds. Study of the texts, Pariyati, was useful, he said, but should not become an end in itself. There was no true conclusion to such study. Without practicing the teachings, monks ran the risk of being like cowherds who'd never drunk milk. There was another kind of study, an internal pariyati. Are you just going to keep on studying endlessly without a fixed goal? Or do you have an end in mind? Study is good, but it's an external pariyati. The internal pariyati requires you to study these eyes, these ears, this nose, this tongue, this body, this mind. It's the true pariyati. What happens when the eye contacts a form? The ear hears a sound. The nose smells an odor. The tongue tastes a flavor. The body contacts a tangible object or mental phenomenon arises in the mind. How does it feel? Is there still greed? Is there still aversion? Are you deluded by forms, sounds, odors, these ears, this nose, this tongue, this body, this mind? That is the internal pariyati, and it has an end. You can graduate. Working is Dhamma practice. Outside of the annual rains retreat period, various work projects were undertaken, most of which involved the building or repair of Sangha dwellings. Lack of funds determined that much of this work was performed by Sangha members, but even on occasions when the work could have been hired out, it was rare for Luang Po to give permission for that to be done. Work projects provided opportunities for strengthening the cohesion and harmony of the community through concerted effort on tasks that, unlike meditation, had tangible, measurable results. Working for the common good provided a jolt for monks overly concerned with their own welfare and increased the affection and sense of belonging that Sangha members felt for the monastery. Work projects were means by which Luang Po's disciples were encouraged to further develop those qualities of consistent effort and patient endurance that Luang Po believed to be vital to progress in meditation. Certainly, manual labor for many hours a day in high temperatures and stifling humidity, sustained by one simple meal, was not for the faint-hearted. Work projects gave monks the opportunity to practice mindfulness in more fluid situations and afforded Luang Po the opportunity to monitor how well the monks could maintain their practice outside of the Dhamma Hall. Most of the monks were used to hard physical labor in the rice fields. In later years, when the community had grown much larger, Work projects gave a means by which young monks and novices could channel any surplus outgoing exuberance into useful activities. On certain projects, Luang Po would keep the monks working until late into the night, surrounded by hurricane lamps that were besieged by insects. Some monks worried that their meditation practice was suffering. Luang Po replied, This is practice. As you work, look at your mind. How does it feel when I ask you to perform this kind of task? 
Practice doesn't mean evading things all the time. You have to come out and face up to the defilements, so that you know what they're like. Once you've trained, then you have to climb up into the ring. In the future, you will see the fruits, but for the time being, don't blame or praise. Just do the work. Every now and again, a disgruntled monk might leave, but the vast majority trusted in Luang Po's judgment. Ajahn Liam was one of those who thrived during this kind of practice. During work projects, Luang Po emphasized giving up our own comfort and desires for the benefit of others. This kind of sacrifice is the dana, the giving of monks. It arises in a generous heart that considers the welfare of the community. In fact, there's plenty of time. But when we hurry, craving makes us feel that we're short of time. At Wat Ba Pong, we don't work with craving. We work in the spirit of self-sacrifice. We show how making sacrifices for the group is a beneficial Dhamma practice. The most legendary of the Wat Ba Pong Sangha work projects was the four-month-long construction of a road up a steep, thickly forested hill to Wat Tham Sang Pet, a branch monastery some 80 kilometers to the north of Wat Ba Pong. Ajahn Anik was one participant. In the following paragraphs he recounts the scene, and he refers to a plant, Ma Mui, which, when touched, produces an almost unbearable itchiness and was one of the reasons why the workers from the highways department swiftly disappeared. The head of the highways department said that if Luang Po had really decided to go ahead with the project, he would send people to help. But after two or three days, the men from the highways department had had enough. They couldn't endure the mamui. They said, this level of work needs a proper budget, you need explosives and tractors. It can't be done with this number of people. Luang Po sat there and said nothing. The day after the highways people left, we made our own survey. Once we decided on where the road should go, we got down to work. There was hardly any time for rest. We would start work at three o'clock in the afternoon and finish at three in the morning. We got through one pair of flip-flops after another. The work mainly consisted of breaking up rocks and carrying them to where they were to be laid. After a time, the highways department saw that we weren't going to give up and every now and then they would bring up some explosives for us and the villagers helped to set the charges. Luang Po would start teaching lay people after the meal and he'd sit there right through until the afternoon without a break. We'd all have a rest during the middle of the day. And afterwards, when we came out, he'd still be sitting there talking with the lay people. At three, he would start work and do the whole shift until three the next morning. Nobody could keep up with him. When he wasn't supervising, he was raking the rubble. It was strange, we were all younger than Luang Po, but we had to admit that we couldn't keep up with him. He would never be the one who suggested taking a break. At three in the morning, we'd rest for a short time and then at dawn, it was time to leave on arms round. Everyone was exhausted, but he kept us going until the job was finished. It was really tough. We put our lives on the line. At one point I sustained a hemorrhage and internal bruising. I felt a tightness in my chest. I, I couldn't breathe properly. I think that was the start of my heart complaint. Everything had to be done well, well and quickly. If anyone started to make jokes or act playfully, Luang Po wouldn't say anything, but he'd immediately walk away. The next day, there would be a Dhamma talk. He'd say, Act like a monk. Act like a Dhamma practitioner. Whatever he did, he did with total sincerity. And however tired or weary he felt, 
I never once heard him complain. In the mid-1970s, a new Uposita Hall was constructed on a raised piece of land in the centre of the monastery, behind the Dhamma Hall and adjacent to Luangpo's Kuti. As usual, most of the labouring work was done by the Sangha. One day, as the monks and novices carried earth up onto the mound on which the building was to be erected, and Luangpo stood at a distance overseeing the work, a group of teenage boys approached him. They followed none of the prescribed etiquette for such a situation. The boy's leader, showing off to his friends, started to ask cheeky questions, culminating with, Why don't you tell the monks to meditate? Why do you make them work so much? A deadpan long paw replied, If they sit too much, they get constipated. He lifted up his walking stick and poked it into the gang leader's chest, saying, It's not only a matter of sitting or walking meditation. Meditation has to be balanced by working for the benefit of others and by the effort at every moment to maintain right view and understanding. Go home and read about it. You're still wet behind the ears. If you don't know anything about Dhamma practice, keep your mouth shut about it. Otherwise, you'll just make a fool of yourself. Toroman One of the distinctive features of the training developed by Lumpur at Watpapong were practices aimed at thwarting the monks' desires in order to encourage them to look directly at the ways in which craving produced suffering and how letting go of it led to peace. The Thai word for this kind of training is Toroman. In everyday usage, Toroman has lost its sense of training and now refers simply to torture or torment. Quoting the Four Noble Truths, Luang Po would insist that suffering ceases not through turning our back on it, but by fully comprehending its nature. If you don't want to suffer, then you won't see suffering. If you don't see suffering, then you won't fully comprehend it. And if you don't fully comprehend suffering, you won't be able to remove it from your mind. The reasons we don't free ourselves from suffering is precisely because we are always trying to get away from it. If you want to put out a fire, you have to pour water on the flames. Running away from suffering simply makes things worse. You can climb on a plane, but the suffering will go with you. You can dive down into the ocean, but your suffering will dive down with you. You may think that you're escaping it, but you're deluding yourself because it's right there in your mind. You must constantly reflect on Dhamma to firmly establish it in your mind, dare to practice. Living with friends or with a large group should be the same as living alone. Be fearless. If anybody else wants to be lazy, then that's their business. Listen to the teachings. Don't argue with the teacher. Don't be stubborn. Do what the teacher tells you. Don't be afraid of practice. You will work it out by doing it. Of that, there's no doubt. The training involved Luang Po requiring his disciples to do things that they didn't want to do and not to do things that they wanted to do. He emphasized that going against the grain was not to be seen as the goal itself or as a practice that would inevitably lead to some form of purification. The rationale for the training was that it offered the opportunity to observe the way in which craving and attachment are often invisible if followed and give rise to tension and frustration if opposed. Bearing with the discomfort mindfully and looking closely at it reveals its impermanent, suffering and not self-nature. The practice took many forms, often quite mundane. On a more strenuous workday, for example, a kettle of sweet drinks might arrive from the kitchen. On a cold winter day, the drink would be hot, and occasionally 
Luang Po would allow the kettle to be placed under a tree in full sight of the monks without acknowledging it. Monks could not help but observe that although up to that point they hadn't been feeling particularly tired or thirsty, now suddenly they could think of nothing other than enjoying a hot drink. If the monks worried about the drink getting cold before they got to drink it, they would immediately begin to suffer. As long as they kept their ears open for the invitation from Lung Po to stop work, the time would drag intolerably and they would suffer. The moment they gave up and put their minds on the work, thinking, if there's a drink, there's a drink. If there's no drink, then that's all right too. Then the suffering would cease. Toraman is a strategy that demands that the students have great confidence in the teacher. If they harbor the slightest doubt about his wisdom or compassion, they will find it hard to follow this path consistently. The fortitude needed to bear with the unpleasant comes from believing in the ultimate benefit of doing so. Luang Po was able to command that faith without difficulty. Luang Po would tell the monks that when they were put in uncomfortable situations and began to feel oppressed, it was important to recognize that this was the defilements, not they themselves, that were being opposed. Only if they refused to assume ownership of the unpleasant sensations would they benefit from the practice. At mealtimes, he would say that the defilements want the food hot and fast. Dhamma wants the food cold and slow. When you don't get the food you want, how you want it, when you want it, how does it feel? On weekend mornings, lay supporters from Warin and Ubon would arrive with food to offer for the Sangha's daily meal. The food tended to be richer than the usual daily fare, and it was an open secret that many monks looked forward to the weekend with pleasure. On days when the food was plentiful, Luang Po liked to sit talking to the donors after the food had been distributed, while his disciples sat, bowls full of food in front of them, struggling with feelings of restlessness, greed and hunger. Finally, after a period of time that to some of the monks had seemed excruciatingly long, but had in fact rarely lasted more than five or ten minutes, Luang Po would raise his hands and begin the blessing chant. Signaling the beginning of the meal. On some days, there would be an extra twist of the knife. It was Luang Po's custom to clear his throat before leading the blessing. This cough became an ardently awaited sound. Knowing this, Luang Po would occasionally cough in his usual way, pause for a moment, and then continue talking. One fabled hot season Toraman practice involves late morning meditation sessions in which the Sangha would dress in their full set of robes and sit in a room whose doors and windows were closed in order to produce an almost overpowering heat and stuffiness. Before long, the monks would be soaked in sweat. Luang Po, sitting in their midst, would encourage them, Come on! You've spent nine months in your mother's womb. This bears no comparison. In the cold season, the practice was reversed. Luang Po would lead the monks in nighttime meditation sessions, wearing only their thin cotton unsas and lower robe, while the windows were open to receive the bitter north wind that cut its way through the monastery at that time of the year. At least, monks comforted themselves. It kept them free of drowsiness. Luang Po's Dhamma talks are renowned for their capacity to fulfill the Buddha's injunction to instruct, inspire, encourage and exhilarate their listeners. But he did not always intend them to be so uplifting. Sometimes they played a different role in the training. Quite often, Luang Po spoke at great, rambling and repetitive length, simply in order that his audience would learn how to deal with the discomfort of sitting on a concrete floor for a long but indeterminate time. During the rains retreat of 1980, when his health was already in decline, he gave a seven-hour discourse. 
At one point during the talk, he looked around to see a number of the monks in front of him starting to squirm and said, Are you suffering? Can you find a place in your mind where you don't suffer? One particular challenge these long talks posed was their uncertain duration. Monks could not tell themselves to grit their teeth for a certain length of time. Lung Po might stop after two or three hours, or he might also carry on until the 3 a.m. wake-up bell. It was a memorable lesson in how the perception of time conditioned the ability to bear with the unpleasant. How letting go wasn't an ideal to work towards in the future, but an immediate necessity. Physically, it was especially hard work for the Western monks, as monastic etiquette prohibits listeners of a Dhamma talk from sitting in the cross-legged position. The only permissible posture on such an occasion is Pappiya, the polite or side-saddle posture. While the Thai monks had been sitting in this posture all their lives, it was, to the Westerners, an awkward and unbalanced way to sit, and certainly not a posture that they would have freely chosen for a seven-hour session. But during the course of such long talks, the advantage the Thais possessed through familiarity with the posture would fall away. They would join the Westerners in being able to see the arising and passing away of a whole spectrum of emotions, interest, inspiration, indifference, boredom, drowsiness, restlessness, irritation, resentment, and even, occasionally, acceptance and joy. The policy of frustrating desire covered every area of monastic life. If Lung Po knew someone wanted to go somewhere very badly, then he wouldn't let him go. If he badly wanted to stay, he might well be sent away. Showing greed for requisites was sure to lead to grief. A Toraman regime is not without weaknesses. It's limited by its inherent elitism. It provides the best results in a small but highly motivated community. With a larger, more varied group, the stresses and strains experienced by the less motivated members can adversely affect the whole, creating a grim atmosphere in the monastery. Young monks can push themselves too hard or become competitive. In addition, a teacher known to train his students in this way may be so intimidating to outsiders as to seriously reduce the number of people who are willing to take up the training in the first place. Ideally, the trainer in Toraman demonstrates that he himself is able and willing to do everything he demands of his students. This was very much the case with Luang Po, who made a point of leading from the front and of not only sharing in the hardships of his students, but exceeding them. However, as Luang Po got older and his health declined, he relaxed a number of these practices. It is debatable as to what extent this change was influenced by the waning of his own physical powers, and to what extent it was a response to a larger sangha that lacked the intensity of the earlier years. Whatever the case, the underlying principle remained constant. Practice means going against the stream, against the stream of our mental activity, against the stream of defilements. Countering a stream is always difficult. It's difficult to row a boat against the current, and because of the flow of our defilements, it's difficult to do good. We don't want to go against the stream. We don't want difficulties. We don't want to have to endure. Mostly, we just want to go with the flow of our moods, like water that follows its natural course. That may be comfortable, but it's not the way of practice. Practice is characterized by going against the grain, going against the defilements and the mind's old ways. It demands mindful suppression, increasing our patient endurance. Many of Luang Po's most rousing exhortations concerned the struggle with defilements. He once gave a simple rule of thumb. 
Any monk who had not broken down into tears of frustration at least three times in his practice hadn't been putting forth enough effort. Don't follow the mind's desires was a constant refrain. Train it. This practice means putting your life on the line. His disciples were to push through obstacles, recognize their lack of substance, and realize that they were paper tigers. If you're sleepy and you want to sleep, don't. After you've got through the drowsiness, then you can sleep. On one occasion, he exhorted the Sangha on the battle against defilements that could occur between alms round and the daily meal. Sometimes you get back from alms round and you're sitting there meditating before the meal. But you can't do it. Your mind's like a mad dog slobbering with desire for food and it won't contemplate anything at all. Or else the contemplation can't keep up with the greed and so you just run with the greed, and then things really go downhill. If your mind won't listen and refuses to be patient, push your bowl away, don't let it eat. Train your mind, torment the defilements. Don't keep following them. Push your bowl away and leave. If there's so much craving to eat, if your mind won't listen to you, then don't eat. The saliva will dry up when it realizes it's not going to get any food. It'll have learnt its lesson, and in future it won't disturb you. It'll be afraid of going without. It'll be silent. Give it a try. If you don't believe me, then see for yourself. He would talk a lot about courage, of daring to go against the defilements, of how it was that faith takes us beyond the fears of hunger pain and death. He pointed out how fear of suffering hobbles the mind and how reflecting on what's really essential to life can overcome that. Reflect on what's most important in life. What is that, the most important thing? It's the thing without which you die. That's what's important. And all you really need to keep alive is plain rice and water. Everything else is a bonus. As long as you have a sufficient amount of rice and water to eat every day, you won't die. Be frugal. When you lack something you want, then ask yourself whether the lack of it will kill you. Take enough rice and water to give you strength to practice. Don't worry about whether or not you get anything in excess of rice and water. The important thing is that you have enough of these two things to keep you alive. And there need be no fear of going without them. Arms round, even in the poorest villages, will provide a monk with a lump of sticky rice. If it starts to drizzle while you're practicing walking meditation, then think of those times when you were farming, your work trousers still not dry from the previous day, and first thing in the morning, having to put them on wet. Going down to get the water buffalo out of the pen below the house. Outside, all you can see is its neck. But then, when you pick up the rope, you realize it's covered in shit. And then the buffalo flicks its tail and splatters you all over with even more of it. As you walk to the fields, your foot rot is playing up, and you're thinking, why is life so much suffering? Why is everything so hard? Think of that. And then ask yourself what the big problem is about walking meditation in the rain. Working in the paddy fields involves much more suffering, and you've managed that. Why can't you do this? You have to dare to do it. Dare to practice. If you've never been to a cremation forest, then you should train yourself to go. If you can't manage it at night, then go during the day. Go later in the day, go often, and after a while, you'll be able to go there at dusk. 
By going against the grain, monks could discover for themselves that the fears and limitations holding them back were not fixed and unalterable things, but merely the results of habit that they had the capacity to overcome. Luang Po was blunt about those who only put effort into what they enjoyed and avoided what they disliked or feared. They were deluding themselves if they thought they were practitioners of Dhamma. No matter how long monks had been in robes, if you are still following your likes and dislikes, you haven't even started to practice. There was no alternative to total commitment. If you're really practicing, then, to put it simply, it's your life, your whole life. If you're really sincere, then why would you be interested in whether someone else is getting something that you're not? Or if they're trying to pick a quarrel with you, there's nothing like that in your mind. Other people's actions are their own business. Whether other people's practice is on a high or low level, you don't give attention to things like that. You pay attention to your own affairs. It's when you have this attitude that you find the courage to practice, and through the practice, wisdom and profound knowledge will arise. If your practice is in the groove, when you're really practicing then it's night and day. At night time, you alternate sitting and walking meditation at least two or three times. Walk and then sit. Sit and then walk. You don't feel like you've had enough. You're enjoying yourself. Discourses would switch back and forth between descriptions of the well-practicing monk and pointing out how far his students were from that level, how much work they needed to do. He gave an analogy for his students who were still following their likes and dislikes and not facing up to challenges. It's like your roof has a leak in it over here, and so you go and sleep over there, and then it starts to leak over there, and so you shift somewhere else and spend your time lamenting, when will I ever have a nice place to live in? If the roof was to become full of leaks, you'd probably just move out. That's not the way to practice. If you follow your defilements, things just get much worse. The more you follow them, the more your practice declines. And then would come the encouragement. But, if you go against the grain and keep practicing, eventually you'll find yourself amazed at your mind's incredible appetite for practice. At this stage, you become completely uninterested whether other people are practicing or not. You just constantly work at your own practice. Whether people come or go, you just keep doing your work. It's this looking at yourself that is the practice. Once you're fluent, then there's nothing in your mind except for Dhamma. In whatever area you still can't do it, wherever you have an obstruction, the mind circles around that spot. It won't give up until the problem's been cracked. And when the problem's been dealt with, then the mind gets stuck somewhere else, and so you work on that. And you don't give up until you've cracked that one too, because there can be no real sense of ease until these matters are seen to. Your reflections need to be firmly focused on the issue at hand, whether you're walking or sitting. The problem that the meditator now faces becomes all-absorbing. He feels the weight of an unresolved issue or an ongoing responsibility. Luang Po said it felt like being a parent. You leave your child to play by itself upstairs while you go down to feed the pigs. While you're doing that, you're anxious all the time that your child is going to fall off the veranda. It's the same with our practice. Whatever we're doing, we don't forget our meditation object for a moment. As soon as we become distracted, it immediately beats at the mind. We keep following it night and day, 
not forgetting it for a moment. Practice has to reach that level for it to be successful. It's not an easy task. As the practice progresses, it gains momentum. There is less need for the teacher. To begin with, it's necessary to depend on the teacher and his advice. When you understand, then put it into practice. It's up to you to do the work yourself. If you're negligent in any area, or something bad arises, then you will know for yourself. There will be the knowing. It will be prachatang. The mind will know naturally whether it's a big fault or a small one. It will try to look at just where the fault lies. Try to do its practice. Joy in the Dhamma It was considered normal and not necessarily a bad thing in itself that monks putting forth effort to overcome defilements became tense at times or felt frustrated. Lung Po would say that if monks felt no inner resistance to their practice, then they probably weren't doing enough to oppose old habits. He would nonetheless keep his finger on the pulse of the community and a clear eye out for signs of monks becoming obsessive or depressed. If he felt the atmosphere was too intense, he would invite the Sangha around to his guddi for an informal gathering. On these evenings, the atmosphere was warm and intimate. He would often relate anecdotes from the old days or tell funny and uplifting teaching stories. However long the sessions lasted, and even if they went on until well after midnight, everybody was still expected to be at the 3 a.m. morning session. Nobody wanted to leave. One monk summed it up. Walking away from Lung Po Skuti one time, I thought, these are the nights I'll remember when I'm an old man. Lung Po had a deep well of stories. In addition to a lifetime of experience with monks and their flaws to draw upon, he also knew how to adapt local folktales and humorous stories for teaching purposes. Much of the enjoyment these stories provide depends on familiarity with the culture they mirror and they often lose a lot in translation. But the tale of the Bla Chon gives something of their flavour. Ajahn Tongjan heard Luang Po tell this story at a time when a number of young monks had caught the teaching bug. It was a common phenomenon amongst monks whose meditation practice was starting to progress. Armed with a vocabulary gleaned from Luang Po's Dhamma talks, these monks, hot with knowledge, tended to make a nuisance of themselves, sharing their insights at great length with whoever would listen or could not escape. The story Luang Po told dealt with fishing, a subject familiar to all the monks, and featured the Bla Chon, or serpent-headed fish, considered by many to resemble the human penis. Ajahn Tongjan recounted the story as he remembered Luang Po telling it. There was once a newly married couple who, following the old tradition, lived in the wife's family home. The young husband was constantly trying to find ways to impress his mother and father-in-law. He wanted them to see what a capable son-in-law they had acquired, how hard-working he was how good he was at making a living. Every evening, the young man would accompany his father-in-law down to a nearby stream where he would set a catfish trap, a bamboo basket weighed down with rocks containing a lump of termite mound full of termites as bait. Early in the morning, the young man would check his catch. In those days, people were very poor, Cloth was hard to come by, and the young man had no underpants. After he'd taken off his trousers on the river bank, he would go down into the water naked. On one particular day, he found that the trap was crammed full of the lucrative catfish thrashing around wildly, unmixed with the blamo, the climbing perch, or blachon that earned a lower price. It was a very good catch. The young man was so overjoyed with his success 
that he forgot to put his trousers back on before running back to the house with the trap full of fish, eager for the praise he felt sure he would receive. He bounded up the stairs to the house, still marvelling to himself nothing but catfish, and rushed in on his wife, who was rinsing the sticky rice grains. Hearing his voice, she looked up, only to see him standing before her stark naked, saying nothing but catfish. Pointing to his groin, she said, Then where did the Bla Chon come from? Her words broke the spell, and the young man, looking down at his nakedness, turned bright red before sprinting back to the stream for his trousers. Luang Po told the young monks that wanting to show off about their practice, oblivious of their embarrassing faults visible to everyone, made them just like the young man who was so keen to impress his family that he didn't realize that he was exposing his Bla Chon. Governance of the Sangha The Sangha is structured hierarchically, with seniority determined by length of time spent as a monk, measured by annual rains retreats. A monk of ten years standing, for example, is referred to as a monk of ten rains. The Buddha's teachings on the qualities that leaders of monastic communities should possess tend to focus on moral and spiritual values. There is little detailed discussion of the exercise of power. The Vinaya texts do, however, make it clear that unanimity should be sought in community decisions on contentious matters. On the other hand, the will of the majority may be the guide in minor issues where strong feelings are unengaged and a vote will not alienate the minority and affect the harmony of the Sangha. As Buddhism evolved in Thailand, it became more institutionalized and the dominant model for governance of monastic communities that emerged was of a benevolent dictatorship, tempered by the checks and balances embedded in the Vinaya. This development was conditioned by many factors, not least of which were the laws of the land, which put various legal powers in the hands of abbots, whose appointments had to be recognized by the state. As most of those who join a forest monastery do so out of faith in the abbot, and with a willingness to submit to his judgment in the matter of their training, a system in which power resides primarily with him is uncontroversial. The system's paternalism may be traced back to the Buddha's declaration that the relationship between teacher or preceptor and student should be modelled upon that of father and son. The integrity of the system is dependent upon the fact that membership in the Sangha is completely voluntary and that no barriers are put in the way of those who wish to leave. This, combined with the demand for leaders to keep all the Vinaya training rules without exception, means that the scope for abuse of power is severely limited. Luang Po's style of leadership largely conformed to the benevolent dictator template. However, his emphasis on creating a durable institution that was not overly tied to him and that could survive and prosper independently of him led him to tweak it in significant ways. Luang Po took almost all major decisions himself but he made a point of listening to the views of his disciples and encouraging them to express their opinions in an appropriate fashion and at an appropriate time and place. Ajahn Suryon recalled, First of all, he would determine a basic plan or principle, and then he would ask for the opinions of the Sangha. If it was appropriate, he would also consult the lay people. In some cases, his idea might have some weakness, and he was able to modify it. Often his idea was good, but by listening to other views, he was able to know what the general feeling was and address any worries there might be. Luang Po was an intimidating figure by dint of his position, his personality, his charisma, and the belief that almost all shared that he was an enlightened being. There was no question that he possessed the natural authority to exercise his will without consultation. But he chose to give his disciples the sense that he listened to them 
and that he could be flexible when faced with intelligent arguments. The system worked well because, ultimately, the monk's confidence in his judgment was such that they were able to accept his decisions even if they did not always agree with them. There were many occasions in which Luang Po made use of formal meetings of the Sangha to deal skillfully with community issues. The decision as to whether to allow a monk from another tradition to attend the Patimoka recitation mentioned earlier mm. is one example. Another occasion in which he found himself in disagreement with the main body of the Sangha occurred when a lay supporter asked permission to offer a vehicle to the monastery. Luang Po had told the would-be donor that before giving an answer he would have to consult with the Sangha. At the next formal gathering of the community, he canvassed opinions on the matter. Assuming the outcome to be a foregone conclusion, those called upon to speak were enthusiastic. A monastery vehicle could be used when Luang Po went to visit branch monasteries. It could be used in the case of a medical emergency. There were so many ways in which it would be useful. When it came time to offer his summation, however, Luang Po surprised the whole assembly by announcing that he opposed the motion and then went on to rebut, one by one, all of the arguments that had previously been put forward to support it. The emotional impact of his words was considerable. Personally, I have a different view on this from all of you. The way I see it, as monks or summoners, in other words, men of peace, we should be content and of few wishes. In the mornings, we carry our bowls out on arms round and receive food from the villagers to sustain our bodies. Most of the villagers are poor. If we live on the food they offer us, and we have a vehicle and they don't, think about it, how would that look? We should be aware of our status as disciples of the Buddha. Given that the Buddha never had a vehicle, I say it's better that we don't either. If monks do start accepting vehicles, then sooner or later there'll be news about this monastery's vehicle overturning, and that one's knocking someone over. It'll be an utter mess, and these things are a real burden to look after. Formerly, monks had to walk everywhere. In the old days, if you went on Tudong, you'd never get a lift in a car like nowadays. If you went on Tudong, then it really was Tudong, up mountains and down to the valley floors. You'd walk everywhere. You'd walk until your feet were covered in blisters. But these days, people say they're going on Tudong and they go by car. They go to tour around different regions. They drive right through the forest. They to dong. It doesn't matter if we don't have a vehicle. What does matter is that you practice well. Then, when the celestial beings, the devas, see you, they will be filled with faith and inspiration. That's why I'm not going to accept this vehicle that they want to offer. It'll be even more convenient. You won't have to tire yourselves out washing and wiping it. Please, remember this point. Don't allow yourselves to be swayed by the wish for convenience and ease. After the meeting, one senior monk said with a rueful smile on his face, it was like we attached targets to our chests for the firing squad. One year, when many temporary monks were spending the rains retreat in the monastery, a theft occurred. Inquiries and appeals for the missing object to be returned all proved fruitless. Finally, Luang Po announced that they would have to take recourse to the ancient method by which, one by one, each member of the community would make a solemn vow of their innocence, calling upon them and their families to be cursed for seven generations if they told a lie. After he had let this sink in for a while, Luang Po announced that before he took such a drastic step, he would give the guilty party one last chance. Everyone was told to return to their kuti, make a small bundle, and then, on returning to the darkened Dhamma hall, place it on a pile in the middle of the floor. 
When all the bundles had been deposited, and the monks were sitting at their places, lanterns were lit, and the bundles were examined. The missing article was discovered in the middle of the pile. Disputes amongst members of the Sangha were infrequent, but not unheard of. When the quarrelling parties were summoned to his kuti, Lung Po would refuse to accept that either party was completely in the right or wrong. He would say that both sides must have contributed to the dispute to some extent or other, and both were culpable. Ajahn Suryon was present at probably the most extreme incident to occur. There was a dispute the year I arrived. It reached the point where one monk started chasing after the other with a knife in his hand. Lung Po showed no sign of fear or hesitation. He spoke from his seat in a very normal voice. The monk came back, put down the knife and started to cry. Overall, there were very few problems. Maybe it was the power of the Dhamma, of the virtue and goodness that Lung Po had accumulated. Even if there were odd incidents, there were no harmful consequences, there was never any danger. When Lung Po spoke, then that would be the end of it. People could put down their enmity. He wouldn't allow us to drag up old matters. The knife-waving incident and Lung Po's response to it were exceptional. It was clearly understood by all at Wat Bapong that physical violence was completely unacceptable. Nevertheless, one day many years later, monks leaving the Dhamma Hall after the evening practice session came across two teenage novices in the middle of a fight, lashing out at each other with their flashlights. The following day, after evening chanting, the Sangha was convened before Lung Po's Kuti. Ajahn Supon was one of the monks present. After Lung Po had instructed us on a number of matters, he eventually told the two novices to come out to the front, where he questioned them about what had occurred the previous evening. After he'd examined them, he said that in the 25 years since he'd established the monastery, this was the first time that there had been a fight amongst the novices. He explained concisely why it was such a bad thing to happen, and then he made an announcement to the Sangha. On consideration, I see no benefit in allowing these two novices to live here any more. Although one of them has only recently gone forth, and his actions are more forgivable, this other one has been here two years, and not only is he still unable to set a good example to others, he has also behaved unacceptably. I see no point in the two of them continuing here. What is the opinion of the Sangha? After Lung Po had spoken in that way, nobody dared to say anything. If anyone had spoken up with good reasons why they should be allowed to stay, there might have been a different outcome. But there was silence. Lung Po finally asked Ajahn Virapon to provide a response on behalf of the Sangha. Ajahn Virapon said he agreed with Lung Po. At first, Lung Po threatened to have the novices disrobe there and then and go home in their bathing cloths. But in the end, he allowed them to stay until the following morning. When another fight broke out between two young monks the following year, Lung Po was more peremptory. Get out. If you're going to act like that, then you can't stay here. Go. You can't live with me. Find a pair of trousers. It was the last of such incidents. Delegation an important element of Luang Po's efforts to create a strong Sangha was his policy of delegating authority. In the Vinaya texts, the appointment of officers of the Sangha requires a short ceremony to be performed at a formal meeting of the Sangha. At Wat Bapong, it was more relaxed. Luang Po would simply announce that he was appointing such and such a monk to take on specific responsibilities to act as the monastery secretary or storekeeper, to look after the cloth cupboard, to take responsibility for assigning lodgings, 
or in later days, to oversee the electricity supply. Monks were chosen on the basis of their competence for the particular task, and were cautioned to perform their duties diligently and impartially, free from bias caused by greed, aversion, delusion and fear. As monks became more senior, Luang Po required them to give Dhamma talks and sent many of his most trusted disciples away to establish branch monasteries. In 1979 and 1981, he spent the rains retreat elsewhere, partly in order to give his designated successor Ajahn Liam and other senior monks experience in running Wat Bapong in his absence. This proved a prescient move, as it enabled the monastery to adapt remarkably well when Luang Po became seriously ill and unable to continue as abbot from late 1981 onwards. Luang Po sought to encourage his disciples to contribute to the welfare of the community in whatever way they could. Everyone had something to offer. It's like the trees at Wat Bapong. Every one of them is of benefit. The small trees, the big trees, the short and the long, and the bent. All are useful if we know how to select the right one for the job in hand. Luang Po would often comment on how other forest monasteries had drastically declined after the death of the abbot. This was always a danger when the loyalty and devotion of the monks was almost exclusively focused on the teacher while the fostering of a sense of community and loyalty to the monastery itself was neglected. Luang Po did not want this to happen at Wat Bapong. Giving the monks responsibilities gave them experience, self-confidence, and above all, a sense of participation and belonging. Luang Po spoke often of respect for the Sangha, and how the welfare of the Sangha must always take precedence over that of the individual. Nevertheless, when he felt that the Sangha had overstepped its authority or behaved unwisely, he would provide an admonishment. One such occasion occurred when the disquiet felt by many members of the Sangha at the behaviour of one of the senior monks reached a tipping point. The monk in question was one of the more eccentric figures at Wat Bapong. He was known for his love of chanting, and for his bubbly, sometimes slightly manic, outgoing personality. His behaviour, especially towards lay supporters, was considered by many monks to be undignified and inappropriate. Matters came to a head when, in the absence of Luang Po, the Sangha convened a meeting to discuss the monk's behaviour, and after a vote decided that he should be formally censured. The monk accepted the Sangha's decision with good grace, but was deeply hurt. He insisted that he had no bad intentions. It was just that every now and then he forgot himself. Everyone awaited Luang Po's return and his decision on how to proceed. On the evening of his return, the Sangha gathered below Luang Po's kuti. He listened in silence to the account of the Sangha meeting. Then, without asking any questions, and without hearing the accused monk give his side of the story, he began to give a Dhamma talk. He spoke about how character traits varied. Even the great Arahants had different habits and personalities, the result of gamma they had created in the past, which were unconnected with defilement and remained after enlightenment. He mentioned Venerable Sariputta, who had previously been born as a monkey for many lifetimes, and as a result every now and then, acted in an eccentric, almost monkey-like fashion, most famously by occasionally jumping over puddles. Differences of personality were also to be seen amongst those still striving to cleanse their minds of defilement. There were those of a predominantly lustful temperament, those with a negative, fault-finding mentality, and those with a slow and dull disposition. There were those given to thought and worry, those with a devout temperament, and those with a naturally intelligent disposition. The differences between these character types are superficial. Ultimately, they are all one and the same. 
they are all equally impermanent, unsatisfactory and selfless, all ungraspable. Like a lemon, a chili, sugar cane and boropet. All these things are born on the earth, but their flavour is different. The lemon has a sour flavour, the chili is hot, the sugar cane is sweet, and the boropet is bitter. Their unity lies in the fact that once born of the earth, they all have to die. Luang Po's teacher, Luang Pu Thong Rat, was acknowledged as a monk of high attainments, but was never a greatly loved figure. He could be rude and aggressive and act in eccentric ways. Many people thought he was crazy. On one occasion, the villagers, I don't know whether they did it on purpose, in order to provoke him or what, they put a live fish in his bowl. They'd only just caught it, and it was still tied up in jute twine. He received it in his bowl, and then took it down to a stream and released it. He said to the fish, Well, it's better, my friend, than if they'd killed you. When he died, his only possession was a razor. He had no other possessions. At his funeral, a strong wind blew up, and it poured with rain for just a moment and then stopped, just enough to see that it was a marvel. The reason that I've told you stories like this is so that all of you may see that sometimes strangeness is not so strange at all. It's normal. Luang Por admonished the Sangha for making too much out of a minor matter. Their efforts should be put into developing the path of practice, not into finding fault with each other. There were always going to be monks whose behaviour was not particularly inspiring. Don't let your feelings of satisfaction or dissatisfaction be your criteria. If you do that, you will be elevating your moods above the Dhamma. Whatever you do, you must be circumspect and use your wisdom faculty. Some things will be too small, some too big, some to your liking and some not. But if the matter doesn't involve transgression of the Vinaya, then you should be able to let it go. Monks should not waste their time in meaningless disputes. It's like the two monks who started arguing about when the sun is closest to the earth. One said, in the morning, because that's when it's biggest. The other said, at noon, because that's when it's hottest. They went to ask the teacher to adjudicate. He said, go and eat your lunch. <laughs>